Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this AMS Automotive Evolution live stream on battery production, packing the power in battery system production. I'm your host, Christopher Ludwig, Editor-in-Chief here of AMS and Ultima Media. Thanks for joining us. Apologies for the, for the slightly delayed start. We've got a lot to get through and a whole lot of in expert insight to bring you. The battery supply chain is exploding um, in, in value, uh, in investment, and in planned volume, but now I think comes uh, comes the hard part, scaling it up, bringing it to production, actually making this real. Uh, that's exactly what we're going to be talking uh, about today with our expert panel who will be joining me shortly. You're going to be hearing from Scania Group on the battery module assembly. Uh, we have um, a battery startup, Pacor. We've got uh, a battery um, association in Europe, Recharge. We've got expertise from S&P Global, and we have an important material uh, and component supplier in Henkel. Uh, so we're going to go through the battery value chain, talking about uh, key developments and how we scale up production. And we're, we're taking your questions as well. So lots to get through, and we're really excited about it. But first, just to frame a little bit where we are and, and what's happening, as we said, is huge investment uh, across, the, across the battery value chain. Uh, battery is the linchpin to the EV, EV revolution uh, in terms of the technology and, uh, and the ability to, to produce it. And we see uh, inc increasing plans for gigafactory and cell production um, in Europe. Obviously, there's a huge amount in China, huge investment in China. We're also seeing it in Europe and latterly in North America as well, right from the cell level down to module pack and upstream too. But of course, um, and, and, and we see, I mean, according to some forecasts, this, you'll see this between 4,000 gigawatt hour, 5,000 gigawatt hour plan by 2030. Um, maybe some questions about who's who's going to really achieve the, the the capacity in that space or not. But nonetheless, the direction of travel is very clear. But when we look upstream, there's clearly some challenges with price and supply volatility when it comes to the critical components and materials, like the nickel, lithium, cobalt, uh, and also uh, exacerbated by the Russia-Ukraine crisis. When we think about components like neon gas, etc., palladium that are key to some of the components in, in the electrical side, that's certainly impacting the short-term view. What does it mean in the medium to long term? Something we're going to unpack a little bit today as well. And of course, regulations as well. The regulatory side, if we look to Europe, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of involvement from Brussels to, to create a, a localized value chain uh, for, uh, for Europe, for the battery supply chain, as well as to ensure that it is sustainable. Um, so lots of questions, too, in terms of what that will mean. Again, when we go upstream, uh, how quickly some of that can be implemented, what's realistic versus what, what is being planned. Um, and of course, what's really interesting, something I really look forward to unpacking with our panel a bit, is that the, the, the timescales we're talking about for some of these investments uh, really compress what we typically see in the automotive industry, where we typically have five to seven year development cycles, pretty long ramp up periods. Here we're talking about putting these gigafactories online much quicker, um, really scaling things in a short period of time. That's forcing decision making at a faster level, forcing investment at a faster level, and we think clearly implications for manufacturing as well. We talk about that planning and scaling up too. Lots of joint ventures, lots of new alliances, partnerships across the value chain uh, between the traditional players, startups, cell manufacturers, uh, tier ones getting in the mix, and of course, again, looking upstream into the mining value chain as well. But when we get down to the plant level, uh, lots of interesting opportunities in automation and digitalization. We already know that the battery battery pack is an EVs have fewer components, perhaps are mechanically simpler, bigger parts, so in some ways more opportunities for automation. Um, but caveating that, these are high tech high tech components, high tech um, um, uh, parts when we think about it in comparison powertrain. This is a computer as well as being a um, a, a very large and significant part as well. Uh, it's a software defined as a connected car too. Uh, there's complexities around heat thermal management and, and many other aspects as well. So this also impacts on the supply chain and certainly on the manufacturing. 
and questions as well about next generation cell and pack design, whether we're going from uh, pack to um, cell to pack or, or cell to chassis, what, what will that mean uh, to production as we're scaling up now as well? So a lot to get through. I think we have a great panel to do it as well, who I'll be bringing on in a moment. A little bit about the run of show today. Uh, we're going to kick off with some with some panel discussion on uh, looking upstream in particular and aspects of Gigafactory. Uh, we're going to show you an interview with uh, with Tony Pershing, head of battery production at Scania, looking on the OEM side. We'll then bring our panel back to talk more on the module and pack side of things, and we'll look ahead to the future of battery production as well. This live stream from AMS today is sponsored by Henkel, uh, a very important supplier in the context. We'll hear more from them as well. So very pleased to have uh, have Henkel with us. Before I bring uh, our panel out, uh, hot off the press, literally today, just published today on the AMS website, our latest digital edition. Um, um, you can you get a link, which is going to be put into the chat now. So room for you to, to check out there. We've got interviews uh, with the likes of Javier Varela, who is the head of engineering, R&D, and manufacturing at Volvo Cars. So again, another, another place for interesting developments on the battery side, uh, along with features on Ineos, Magna, and Audi, much more besides. So really encourage you to check that out and join us, but um, and uh, keep up with happening, what's happening on AMS. Now, I'd like to, to bring in our panel. So just stop sharing my screen here. Um, I've mentioned we've got we've got a really distinguished group joining us today. Um, I'd like to bring each of them on now. Benoit Lemonian, the CEO and co-founder of Accor, uh, which uh, he helped co-found in 2020 and has been his chief executive since then, helping to lead the company as it plans to ramp up the building of a, of a low carbon batteries, and particularly a gigafactory, which will be located in Dunkirk. We've also recently had a um, uh, innovation in R&D center in Grenoble, so a lot, a lot's going on. He's he's worked for several energy companies. Benoit, great to have you. Climate initiatives also spent time in R&D at Airbus. So really fantastic to have you with us here uh, today, Benoit. I'd like to also invite the first of our two Stefans, Dr. Dr. Stefan Schlack Leon Berro, uh, Executive Director for Inorganic Chemicals, Minerals, Minings, Chemicals at S&P Global recently IHS market, um, uh, a chemicals expert uh, who's been responsible for market assessments and project feasibility, uh, been an analyst for 20 years, also worked as R&D and, and chem R&D chemist as well. So uh, very terrific insight you'll be able to bring us when we look upstream in the battery supply chain. So thank you again for, for joining us, Stefan. Um, but we have thank another you. Stefan, so a good challenge for me to distinguish between Stefan Hofer. Uh, who is the um, global market strategy lead and, and head of e-mobility at Henkel. There you are. Good to see you. Good to see you, Stefan. Stefan, we'll, 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 we'll try and distinguish. I'll say Stefan from Henkel or, or, or chemical Stefan for, for S&P Global, uh, not getting into how much uh, Henkel is also involved in the chemical side. Great to have you with us. Last but certainly not least, Claude Chanson who is the general manager for Recharge. Uh, this is an important European association for batteries, representing battery stakeholders uh, across the region. Uh, um, Claude has worked for SAF, the division of Total, and various management positions, including director of lithium-ion technology and in project management for the automotive industry. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our live panel for today. Uh, thank you all so much for being here with me. So, I want to jump right into things. Um, we, we, you know, I, I'm thinking a lot about what's accelerating the battery supply chain and production right now. What's decelerating uh, it, it, in the industry, particularly, particularly in the context of Europe, where you're all based. Uh, I just want to kick off starting with just that question: uh, what, what is the most important accelerator for companies investing and expanding in battery production operations today? Benoit, as a as a as an upcoming battery manufacturer, I wanted to start with you on that question. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, I see we're um, close to 200 people listening, so it's a great opportunity to share a bit of what we do, where we stand. Um, I think um, uh, I think it can be useful to step back a little bit. We started the Accor a little less than two years ago now with a clear vision. That was electric mobility, was the mobility of tomorrow, uh, but also the mobility of today. Uh, and that uh, localization of the value chain was becoming uh, more and more important. Uh, not even uh, to speak about the need to decarbonize um, the product. So that was the initial vision. 
and, uh, and basically that led us to two important strategic choices. The first one was uh, that we believe, and we, we still are really sound believer of that, that we don't need a new technology to be uh, enabling um, the, the, the electric mobility uh, revolution. So that's, that's the first point. What we need is a huge quantity of battery being produced. And in that context, uh, six, seven years ago, only Tesla was moving forward very, very fast. And the other um, players were standing a little bit um, still and waiting to see what happens. And, and all of a sudden, and it all started with uh, Europe for sure, the acceleration was there. And the acceleration was there for basically three different things. The first one is, of course, the regulation. And I think at that time, Europe was putting a lot of pressure to reduce the carbon footprint of mobility. The second one is the thing that um, battery being produced massively the cost uh, the cost of uh, of such a, a solution was becoming more and more competitive and uh, we do see today that uh, with the rise in oil prices it's even more competitive and i think the first element which is oh, quite often uh, underestimated is that it's cool to drive an ev i mean uh, once you've uh, you've moved from an ic to an ev car you 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 never come back i mean this is uh, this is uh, something that is really uh, something that uh, everyone knows and uh, for those who haven't yet uh, seated in uh, any of those cars, I mean, it can be a Porsche, a Volkswagen, a Renault Zoe, or, or, or a, a, a Tesla, uh, there is no way back. I mean, it's, it's, it's a one-way journey. So all those topics uh, together are now clearly um, out, uh, out uh, uh, in the streets, and you see the volumes piling up. And the thing is, if we want to go in that direction, we need enough batteries. So this is where Vercor stands as a volume enabler, capacity player, uh, leveraging uh, best available technology and focusing on manufacturing to accelerate the volumes. So that, that was the intention. A little bit of where we are today. Uh, we are 100 people growing fast. Uh, we'll be around 200 at the end of the year. We are investing uh, in, a, in a pilot line, what we call the Vercor Innovation Center, localized in the Alps, in the French Alps. It's on its way. We will start the first production in the first few, uh, next few days. Um, for the first few samples, and then we will have an important pilot line up to uh, half a gigawatt hour of production capacity uh, to be able to perform the test and development for the product. And indeed, uh, you, you said it, Christopher, we are developing uh, now a gigafactory project in Dunkerque, a best available site in France and, uh, and western part of Europe, uh, low carbon energy, already prepared site, connection to uh, rail, to, to the road, and, and also uh, to sea transportation a um, lot of local support so we will start the construction of that next year um, around one year from now and we will start uh, uh, the production in 24 and 25 to be in the cars in, in 25. so in a nutshell this is where we are and uh, happy to to participate and share about uh, our our vision and our our uh, uh, role in this value chain that's a, that's a great way to start us off and, and lots of excitement ahead um, perhaps i'll turn to to uh, Chemical, Stefan, uh, for a moment, uh, just to, to talk uh, a little bit on the upstream side. What I'm talking about accelerators for the moment. I think when we get to the decelerators, we, we might run into a few challenges. What, what do you think right now when you're looking at the battery supply chain? What's really, what's really pushing and driving the ramp up? So uh, I think that when we are looking to, to all the, this, this happenings, what uh, Benoit has just been describing, right? So all the factories that are uh, getting started, um, all the, the number of, uh, of construction that's happening, uh, especially in, in Europe right now, you, you named it before Christopher. Um, I think that this is uh, a, a very big part of the key enablement as such, right? Having the infrastructure, having the production capabilities, uh, close to the OEMs, close to the production sites, uh, will be certainly one part of the key uh, to, to success. Um, and on the end, that's also uh, a key enabler when it comes to, uh, to developments from a material perspective. You know that we as, uh, as Henkel are developing thermal materials, gaskettings, adhesives for the development of, of batteries. Um, we are seeing very much fast design changes. We are seeing very much development on the OEM and the very manufacturer side in order to gain efficiencies and also here bringing the material side a bit on a, on a stretch um, in order to uh, also resolve um, many, many, let's say, challenges that were in the conventional car solved uh, through um, 
uh, through other technologies. Now also structural integrity resolved bioadhesives as an example is a big topic. The whole thermal part coming into the automotive world that has not been one of the key uh, elements in, in automotive as such in the uh, in, in the past years, right? So all of that, I think that the, the technology collaboration is one of the biggest enablers in order to keep pace uh, with with this yeah, very, very accelerated growth of the e-mobility right now that we're seeing uh, globally, but especially in Europe, I believe. Great. I think I think we've got some good good sense for what uh, what it, what's driving growth. Maybe I'll turn a little bit to to whether the whether we see some some risks or, or decelerators. Um, Stefan Stefan Schlaff, um, from, from your point of view, when you're particularly uh, I think looking at the upstream materials, minerals, what, where do you see? Do you see some potential risks and, and decelerators um, in, in this growth perspective? Yeah, certainly, you know, something that is being discussed as a decelerator, as a potential decelerator is the availability of raw material um, at the moment. And there, there is, you know, two aspects to um, scarce raw materials is one you know first of all it's it might be scarce there might be not enough to produce all the batteries that are required and second shortage of raw material could and is at the moment um, driving the prices up and that again drives the prices of the battery and of electric vehicles and that certainly is a decelerator it is uh, you know a, a an approximate value would be, I think, uh, about 100 US dollars per kilowatt hour. That should be, you know, is the break-even cost of um, battery storage capacity, uh, traditional combustion engine, and that's and, and and the battery industry was on on a good way was you know close to hitting that break-even um, mid 2021 when you know suddenly shortages of certain raw materials of some of the raw materials was at least perceived and drove the prices up and then you know drove the prices up quite considerably and more recently very extremely with nickel uh coming predominantly from from russia and at the moment not coming from russia uh and that uh, drove the overall cost of storage storage capacity to closer to 200 so the double what what break even cost will be so that clearly is at the moment or will become you know as soon as these prices um are being passed on to battery uh, producers to automotive companies will be a decelerator of that development hmm. we're gonna we're gonna come into a few more of those elements shortly but but claude from your point of view representing um a number of battery players stakeholders you know what, what? What do you? How do you look at the picture in Europe right now? Um, do you see? Do you see more decelerators or do you see more accelerators, so to say? I see many of them. Thanks for the, the good question. Uh, but uh, I would say you are all aware that this uh, battery regulation is representing the intention of the or the vision of our uh, political uh, bodies to support the industry. So we have here a, a global understanding that there is a need of acceleration and there is a lot of support on the European side and we see it for all our membership, which represents the complete value chain. Uh, I mean, all of them and all of the industry is taken on board with this development of the so-called ecosystem, and which include, of course, first of all, the GIGA factory, but also the upstream value chain. So uh, this is really taken on board and everybody has the same the same word which is how to accelerate the transition but unfortunately we see also uh, at the european level a lot of complexity arising with this uh, with the battery regulation particularly and in the battery regulation of course the intent is to support this battery industry and the success of the european industry uh, but we see also an potentially a number of also uh, hurdles or issues that may slow down the development and particularly i mean one aspect is this very strong support to making sustainable battery and we recognize certainly europe could be more competitive 
if sustainability becomes part of the equation. As Benoit was mentioning, in fact, making uh, green batteries could be an advantage for a European industry based on all of this background we have in, let's say, having more uh, sustainable sources and, and, and uh, decarbonize electricity, for example. But the ambition is so large that sometimes we wonder if the intention is really achieved with uh, so much ambition about uh, pushing the limits of sustainability. I would take an example uh, just to, to illustrate this. Everybody has understood and uh, I mean, applaud that carbon footprint declaration would be part of the battery production. This carbon footprint declaration will represent the emissions during the full value chain. And it is really important that this is applied in a very uh, clear, transparent, and uh, competitive way if we want this to become part of the competitive approach of Europe. So this being said, we have to move to a practical solution and uh, tools to make this calculation available and, and, and comparable. And that's where we have a number of discussions. As, as Richard, we have been involved in these uh, environmental footprint and carbon footprint declarations for, for years now. And the ambition here today is very large uh, at such a point that we worry that maybe a too large scope far beyond uh, only electric vehicle batteries, but to all type of batteries, may just make the implementation very difficult on the very short term, that is expected. And if you understand that uh, the implementation is not correctly uh, and strongly uh, controlled, then this is just a new open door to greenwashing and you know uh, uh, declarations that would not reflect the reality. And that would be the contrary of the expectation. If, of course, if the carbon footprint declarations become just a paperwork, this is, will miss the target of helping the European industry being competitive. So this was just an example on this ambition of the regulation where we sometimes worry that, let's say, uh, excessive ambition of uh, the, the, the politician view of where the uh, European industry should go may in fact be a little bit making the road a bit difficult to uh, to succeed in the short term. So we've, we've got quite a, a complex picture there. We have a, a lot of investment, lots of new players, um, obviously demand, technology advancing, but on the one hand, questions on the upstream side, questions certainly on the regulatory challenges and, and also on the process. Stefan from Henkel, um, I wanted to kind of touch upon a point um, we talked about uh, briefly before. We're seeing a kind of change, you know, new, new ecosystem, if you like, um, um, a, a big ramp up. I mean, do you think that this quick ramp up also brings some some challenges or, or on the quality or, or side when we talk about the typical automotive time cycles? I mean, do you do you see in, in, in comparison to other other kind of ramp ups some 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 potential pitch, pitfalls there? Yeah, I mean, Christopher, you, you said it in the very beginning uh, very, very clearly, and I think that this is, that we, we are all aware of that, right? That the transformation that's happening uh, right now in this automotive industry is unique. Um, and it's also a very special one, right? Because it's not about a new industry we are talking about that's ramping up as such something that's newly developed, but we are talking about a very, very mature industry with lots of processes, interdependencies that is now kind of starting from scratch, resetting uh, in, in, in its core, right? So from getting away from the combustion engine over to the, the battery technology, the e-drive, I mean, that's a transformation that's happening that is, I believe, really not happened ever in, in any other industry in that dramatic way. So this means that now even with the, the political um, and the administrative push, towards the electrified mobility, addressing the points Claude was just talking about also on sustainability and also with this, this, this intention to really make that happening fast, there is lots of pressure on, on that industry to make that turn around, right? And I think that this is a huge challenge and we are seeing a speed that's happening that's even shorter than the typical cycles we have been talking about in the introduction uh, of, of roughly five to seven years or so. Um, so now within an even shorter time frame, we're trying to make all that, that transformation. So this means that this um, by definition uh, has challenges, right? And I think that um, the, the challenge will lie on the on processes for the supply chain 
um, it will be an, an issue um, uh, raising in terms of the availability um, and also to adapt processes to fast changes that the let's say surroundings of the OEMs and the battery manufacturers potentially are not used to. Um, I see a, a strong collaboration network happening. I see that um, also the, the um, OEMs are investing dramatically to make things happen. So that's certainly helping. We are seeing uh, a great attitude in terms of uh, exchange and, and, and onboarding uh, to, to be solution oriented. And I think that will be somehow the key, but the challenge is huge as such. And one of the interesting aspects that I think are resulting from this feed are all the kind of partnerships that we're seeing emerge. And Benoit, I, I wanted to turn to you on this because, I mean, even this week, um, Focor announced a partnership with, with Plastic Omnium, which will take a stake. And I believe you'll in the future work together more closely on industrializing side parts of this. You have other partnerships as well, but to me, it just highlights some of these new these changes is that a key part of the ramp up and industrialization strategy for a company like yours yeah i, I think i think the the clear uh, positioning of vercore as uh, is to be um, creating an ecosystem uh, around us to really accelerate that value chain so we've announced an, a deal with sibania steel water they are a nickel producer and we've had a quick catch up about nickel earlier um, onboarding plastic Omnium for us is also a way to um, leverage. Uh, first of all, their worldwide reach when it comes to uh, you know uh, mobility expertise. They have been in the, the fuel tanks business. You know that very well, and um, this is very critical business in terms of safety. So this is a similarity with the battery business, um, and they have a worldwide reach when it comes also to um, manufacturing. For us, it's a good way to accelerate our span because you know that our factory will be the manufacturing cells um, from, uh, from precursors and uh, battery materials. And those cells can be used in a bunch of different uh, type of uses, uh, one of them being cars. And for that, usually we'll have a direct connection with, uh, with the OEMs. But another one is, uh, is uh, what we call distributed mobility business. In such a context, we need to, to be able to propose bespoke modules, so case beat. And this is where, with uh, Plasticomium, we are, you know, enlarging our reach with the same product, but an adaptation at module level and then pack level to serve the needs of, uh, of specific customers. Um, so for us, it's also a way to reinforce um, our industrial um, credibility and uh, uh, expertise on, on a specific topic, which is a mechanical handling of cells and to, 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 um, to have them uh, become modules. We have internal expertise, but uh, uh, with that, we are accelerating. We have discussion with uh, a significant uh, large number of, of uh, same type of players coming from various industries, newcomers, uh, um, but also existing ones that are clearly willing to join to join that uh, that acceleration. Um, when we're also on the partnership mindset, we believe that uh, if you compare Europe to uh, a few other players in, uh, in the States, for example, uh, but mostly in Asia, and now some of them are a very big corporation and uh, I think if we are to be uh, at the right um, scale in terms of efficiency, you know, uh, efficiency is about volume, but not only, but we need to reach a significant volumes to also have the right competitiveness. It's important uh, that we beat uh, the same type of consortiums, but not vertically or horizontally integrated, but by joining forces in the partnership mindset, which also is a way to reinforce the strategic autonomy which is now a clear uh, objective of Europe. I mean, uh, having a, a capacity all along the value chain to be really interconnected and interlinked and not only commercially uh, uh, negotiated deals is something that is bringing the resilience that I think everyone is looking for in this context. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, Stefan from S&P, I wanted to turn back to some of those upstream risks that we, we, we you, you mentioned you mentioned earlier um, there is some talk about whether this might have a long-term impact on the costs of, of, of EVs in terms of some of these price rises um, obviously this is very difficult to, to say for anyone given given the very volatile situations we see in, in geopolitically but from your point of view do you do you see this as a quite long-term risk shift or, or really in the volatility of now that may, we may see to stabilize like we do with many other commodities in terms of, in terms of that longer-term perspective? 
I, I see it as an extreme situation at the moment. Um, prices are unusually high. If you look at historical prices that, that have been seen in the market, the lithium, the cobalt, and the nickel, um, most, most pronounced, those are historically unseen prices. And there are no fundamental reasons why that should be the case. I mean, there may be shortages of, of capacities um, for, for, for a number of months uh, of certain raw materials, but that is not a situation, you know, that, that will last. And, and accordingly, prices will, on the longer term, get back to, you know, where prices normally are, prices being determined by, you know, what the cost is to produce those, those materials in, in the right quality. So that's the measure for commoditized products. And on the long term, I think prices will go back. Um, as I said, at the moment, really prices, uh, the price of the battery was impacted, is about double of what it was. Um, a year ago, and that is only because of the high raw material prices. But that is not uh, something that I would expect to last. There is, you know, Stefan from Henkel, you know, mentioned it before. That was uh, a transformation in the automotive industry that is unseen. It is clear that there is a nervousness. You know, with all the investment, with the decisions by the automotive industry having been taken, they go to electric vehicles. There is the nervousness. There will one. Thing that would be really embarrassing if that would not could not happen because just you know the wrong material to build these things is not there and that nervousness is pronounced at the moment even more so with the situation Russia Ukraine at the moment but nothing that I would expect to last uh, on the longer term. Okay, and and one of the things I mean, Claude, I think it, you partly refer to this in the regulatory ambitions around sustainability too. Um, I mean, there are clear ambitions, I think, from the EU level, but also perhaps from the OEM and batteries as well to localize some aspects of the upstream uh, supply chain, whether that's even even mining of, of of key key components. I I just wonder from your point of view, you know, in the European context um, right now, is that something that is realistic, actually, to support the sort of ramp up. I mean, it's not something that can happen very quickly um, and, and is probably quite limited in areas. I just thought from your members' point of view, uh, how, how, how is that seen? Thanks for the very good question indeed. Uh, when we talk about the ecosystem, we should think not only the supply chain, but the complete value chain. These include, by the way, not only supplying, but also recycling the batteries. And as you know, in this context of raw materials uh, sourcing and having a local value chain, these, all of these aspects are taken on board, which means that we have also strong pressure to make sure that the raw materials coming from battery will be recycled in Europe, will be available again in Europe to, to contribute to this. And this was really considered by, uh, I mean, many, many uh, uh, market studies, and uh, we have been part of some of them, which we confirm that, this is an important pillar, but cannot supply for the growth of the electric vehicle market. So recycling is just one aspect that will not be sufficient. And what is seems to me, I mean, I'm already quite experienced by my white hairs, you can, you can determine. Uh, coming to some point I saw was not so possible, which is I heard only three, five days ago, some uh, following the Ukraine events, some ideas from the high level political view that mining in Europe would be possible again. And I would say before the recent events that are really stressing the importance to really have less dependence, international dependence and being more self-autonomous in Europe may help indeed developing this important part of self-sourcing in, in, in mining in Europe. As you said, this is certainly not global, uh, but you, probably are aware that uh, we have lithium in Europe. There are uh, already a request for mine opening in Portugal, for example, in Spain, and they are going their way. And probably it will be accelerated by the present time circumstances. And 
also by what just Stefan mentioned about the price of commodities at the moment, which of course is just encouraging to uh, to get some more products and uh, to, to make it uh, available on the market. So again, here we should not uh, mix the timelines. Mining is always a quite long timeline, and not to talk about the qualification of this mine to a complete value chain and so on. So these will not provide a release uh, in the five years uh, framework uh, time. Uh, but just beyond that, probably, uh, and we can expect maybe a much larger transformation that we could imagine attached to this uh, European uh, value chain for batteries Im implemented in Europe and driven by this need to have uh, a complete ecosystem in Europe would potentially go much farther than we just all imagine uh, when starting. You know, uh, business as usual is, is maybe not really the right way of thinking. Unfortunately, all of this is just giving long-term perspective. It may not be so helpful for the period of time from now to the next two or five years, because there we will have to face this uh, growing market with the existing supply chain. Yeah, but may, yeah, may I add something? Please. Because sometimes you know, I, I, I uh, agree on, on some aspects with Cloud, but, but I think there is one aspect which is currently over uh, uh, there is too much anxiety in Europe uh, around these raw materials. I really think, you know, for a for a product like lithium that you can get from Argentina, from Chile, from Australia, this is sufficient variety, and I don't think that Europe, under those, you know, with that variety, ever be cut off supplies of lithium. I think that is an exaggeration. I would agree you know that that it is worthwhile to look at lithium from a point of view you know if you think of geothermal brines that's technology that certainly can be developed how you know get lithium from the geothermal brines uh, and i certainly agree when it comes to recycling yeah the, uh, it's certainly a, a good idea for europe to to think of you know getting access to these products with uh, the, the appropriate recycling processes but when it comes to mining I think you know as long as there is a, uh, a sufficient variety of or regional variety of supplies, then it's not every uh, product that needs to be, in my opinion, produced in Europe. Interesting perspective, and I think an important point around the anxiety. I mean, I think I understand why people are anxious, but I think uh, and, and in the in the commodities market, it certainly can have a disproportionate impact. Benoit, do you sort of share this perspective around people are perhaps cooling the anxiety, but but in terms of where, where you see those upstream opportunities, partnerships being important for for the core's ramp up? Yeah, I. I do share it a bit of that. I think um, we have to be always careful of uh, you know the wave and, and and what is on top of the wave because um, I remember in 28 in 28 uh, all of a sudden oil was super scarce and you know everyone was getting you know uh, uh, super impacted by that and then all of a sudden all uh, came out from 147 to down to 27 uh, in like uh, less than one year. So I think there is a lot of um, trading and edging impact okay it's not all of that it's part of that but it's also giving a signal so that new offers come uh, onto the market so for sure we are entering an era of scarcity of resources it's true for energy resources but it's true also for middles i mean seven billion of human beings are just uh, you know depleting the earth we all know that and then the question is um is this going to impact the switch to evs and uh, we don't see that happen at all two reasons for that uh, ask anyone around you in Europe now, uh, would they drive an EV? They can, not for comfort or whatever, but just because it's cheaper, they can and they will. And if you go to any garage, uh, they will tell you so. So yes, uh, EVs may be a little a little more expensive. Okay, we see that Tesla is increasing the price. Clearly, there will be an impact on cost. But also the value chain is organizing and the volumes will be there. So I'm not afraid of uh, of accessibility and security of supply. I do see that we'll have some, you know, roller coaster on the prices, but overall um, difficult. And I'm happy to hear, uh, to hear my colleagues here on what is a, a long-term trend and what is short-term linked to a specific situation, which we all hope won't last forever. Um, so that's what I can share on that. And yes, new partnerships are popping up. Europe will be proposing some production. I would not expect that to reach more than 
30, 40, 50 percent plus recycling, which needs for Europe. And this is something we are really working on also with the European Battery Alliance to team up with partners and players in South America, Indonesia, elsewhere that are also going to be able to supply us with the right level of ambition and expectation when it comes to environmental impact. And I think if you combine those two uh, topics, um, we have a work, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, before us, and we are working on it. But uh, but uh, we do see that we have as an industry the capacity to supply the needs. It will be a challenge somehow, but there is no showstoppers ahead of us. There is a lot of work, a lot of uh, partnerships to be built, but no no showstoppers. Okay, thanks. Well, we're obviously, understandably, we you know wanted to address some upstream issues uh, as as they're important. I want to turn a bit more to the gigafactories and and cells. Although just quickly before I do, a reminder to our audience: uh, if you're enjoying this content, if you're enjoying these discussions, uh, please please consider joining uh, our, our summit coming up in May. Um, you know, we'll have a lot of focus on on battery there as well, and that, including hopefully some from some of our our current panelists as well, that a chance to go deeper. We've got a special offer for you as well that uh, is coming in in the chat now. Um, the price is uh, we've extended the early count, early bird just for this audience. So uh, if you want to book, you have until next Friday to do it. Um, there's a code coming in there as well. So consider joining that as well and talk more about battery production. And another opportunity as well, if you're interested on the supply chain and logistics side, we have another event also in person coming up in Munich. This is for our automotive logistics brand. Um, would also advise you to consider consider joining this if it's interesting to you. And again, happy to extend uh, our early bird offer for that as well, um, just until April 8th. Link's coming through to you in the chat, so use that at your leisure, but you've got a week to do it. I'd really recommend it if you if you have the chance. But getting back to our, our panel and, and a bit more on, on the battery cell side, which is obviously also, which is obviously ramping up. Claude, my understanding is is we are, what, what the, give us an outlay of the land, is it about, 90 plus percent currently imported, I think is, is, is around the figures that, that I've heard. Um, and, and what's the sort of timeline that you see for Europe to become uh, more of a, more of a, a, you know, a net producer of, of cells and, and localize more of that? If you can just give us a, a sense of that to start. Thanks. Um, yes, indeed, we start from far, when, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, supply of uh, cells for automotive industry, uh, probably the numbers are correct to say uh, 90 percent plus is imported. Uh, and uh, of course, then we have to be careful when timeline prediction, because as I said, things are moving fast, and we see indeed that these uh, investments are uh, being prepared in Europe for sales gigafactory. We have uh, Benoit with us today uh, as an excellent example of really things moving on. Uh, this being said, uh, again, based on the uh, the fact that. Electric cars are sold with a long term guarantee, and the car manufacturer will not certainly uh, compromise on the quality and the qualification of their product, which means that uh, during in, in the whole supply chain, this will be uh, translated as uh, verification and quality and uh, requirements, which indeed uh, is affecting the battery uh, value chain because it's quite a long value chain. Uh, we understand that uh, many of the gigafactory today are uh, based on or trying to compete and will compete on existing technologies. Uh, the know-how for, for machines manufacturing for uh, high volume productions is clearly in Asia for that. And therefore, they are uh, rightfully using this, uh, this know-how and, 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 uh, and background. Uh, but then they will have to develop their local uh, supply chain. I understand Benoit was uh, clearly mentioned this in the plan to say, we, of course, there is a need to have then this ecosystem being built up. But I see it uh, taking a little bit of time because the value chain is quite long. Uh, you will have first to use qualified, uh, uh, what is called pre-CAM and CAM cathode active material manufacturing, which is a very specific product, which is of high relevance for the like, duration and the guarantee of performance of the product. And then this uh, cathode manufacturing uh, will have to be imported as well here. And I know that uh, some are doing that already. Uh, but then even in upstream of that, you will have to have the right uh, refined materials and, 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 and processes. And this is for the part of the, the, the key uh, active materials. You have the same for other components like cells, uh, pouch cells, uh, casings. I see again, or, 
a partnership being organized here because indeed there is a lot of know-how and, and performance to be demonstrated and for products that are to be guaranteed for five to seven years which is today what the expectation is so even if we have a strong pressure to accelerate and, and move on uh, we we cannot neglect some uh, significant timeline before the complete ecosystem is really uh, installed and competitive in Europe compared to the existing value chain. Stefan from, from Henkel, I, I mean, as this as this ramps up, um, and we, we spoke about it earlier already on the timelines, and, and that's just from Henkel's point business side. I mean, how how um, how closely involved are you getting in 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 these? battery cell productions and helping to, to deal with some of the, the issues and challenges that, that come with, with that. Is that a key focus for your for your business right now? Absolutely, right? So, I mean, that's that's also an interesting part of, of how that evolved over the last couple of years. And uh, also we as Henkel um, have been kind of identifying new and other areas also to, to work with and to support our customers in, in, in the end, right? So, um, when, when it comes to the battery cell technologies, as an example, we have been stepping also in, in supporting through coding solutions, um, the, the effectiveness of, of the battery cells as such, um, using all our experience also out of other industries in order to apply that and, and try to adjust that to the requirements in the automotive industry. And Overall, also coming back to the to the discussion point that we had here, um, I think we as material supplier have identified the the, the main main trends, the the main moving parts of, of this industry. That's for sure the question on um, the the power, the charging, the driving range, um, the the safety. I mean, that's that's a point maybe we'll touch base on on later on. And what has already been talked about, the question on the sustainability and the circular economy for for the batteries in the end. And this we have then been translating into our strategy to say, okay, when we're thinking on the batteries as such, we need to start from the cell. We need to understand what's happening with the high nickel ones, LFPs, the silicon anode, you, you name it. And what does this then require in in terms of of materials? And and that's what we're addressing, for instance, in, in that area. We have been talking about the change in design, right? That's happening in the industry. That that we are looking to new designs, to new engineering concepts, putting the cells directly on the cooling plate into the pack. That is also then uh, asking for for new technology solutions when it comes to how to make that stable, how to ensure the structural integrity of these uh, these designs. So that's another area where I think we as Henkel can can pay into. Thermal propagation prevention, right, in order to make sure that in the unlikely uh, event of uh, of a battery catching fire, we can make sure that that uh, the people have sufficient time, the passengers, to leave the car. Very interesting side note. I think all of you are aware that this uh, um, administration part, the the legislation is coming out of China, was very very surprising to me uh, that it was kind of China pushing Europe, right, to make that uh, that as an um, uh, happen also within Europe as an important part. Um, and also in the sustainability part, we are with partnerships and that's maybe something when listening to this panel, right, that's popping up uh, in, in every second sentence, also trying to understand with the OEMs, the battery manufacturers and the recyclers and also the equipment manufacturers, in fact, in, on, on that way to understand when we are thinking from the recycling, what is it required in order to ensure that a dismantling is possible? And what does this mean then in the very beginning for the design? So what material, for instance, uh, selection criteria could help to, in the end, also ensure an easy dismantling of the battery, etc. And these are the fields where we are playing into. And I think that's also showing a bit the magnitude uh, of, of all the technologies and areas that we need to touch base into in order to support this this industry uh, to to keep this this pace right, and Ben Wang, we, we should certainly connect then uh, after this panel as well. Well, uh, absolutely, as, as outlined uh, there, and in fact, quite a few of the questions from our audience. Uh, I'm going to address this to you to start, Benoit, Are asking around, you know, issues or opportunities in digitalization and automation in battery cell production, for example, um, perhaps to some of our audience, it's still relatively new processes, not least some of them are more related to the chemical chemistry industry, clearly than to traditional automotive. Um, but, you know, how, how do you how do you see that? How important a role will will some, you know, automation and digitalization processes play for you as you as you ramp up production? 
it's key. Uh, that's why we are developing that uh, innovation center. It's it's not only for the product, but most importantly for the process. We have a very solid team, um, 20 plus expert with uh, with. Uh, uh, I think we listed more than uh, more than 1,000 years of experience in battery manufacturing, and those players uh, come from very big corporations in which they have been developing uh, the processes to automatize. The thing is, as of today, the traditional way of uh, running factories is basically because it's super difficult. I think we need to start with that. It's much more difficult to to, to produce batteries than to drill oil. Uh, I mean, at least it was in the past. Now it's becoming more difficult too. Uh, therefore, we need to combine a, a bunch of different expertise uh, when it comes to electrochemistry, automation, and this is where the digital plays a key, a key dimension to really go to a, a limited number of operators all over the line, because every time uh, this is a risk in terms of a process quality, but more importantly, to have as much automation as possible. So yes, our factory will be tested in, uh, in the VIC and will be fully digitalized in terms of uh, parameters that we will follow and capacity to uh, re uh, be on the right path to reach the yield levels that are key to the success economic success of, of such ventures so yes this is extremely important um extremely challenging we have a clear roadmap on that and we are leveraging our partners so namely capgemini um, uh, schneider electric when it comes to digital automation and uh, we will have uh, a bunch of innovations that we are uh, we are protecting to really enable uh, a new step forward uh, towards the efficiency of these factories so this is a key dimension, automation, digitalization. Absolutely, and, and a big reason why we put this panel together and introduce it to, to a larger audience exactly to hopefully facilitate some of those opportunities. Uh, we have a question from the audience, actually a number again around, uh, as what Stefan was referring to in part, I think that the cell design, um, particularly around whether we see a standardization likely to emerge between cylindrical, prismatic, or pouch in terms of the cell and how that perhaps relates to the to the production as well. Um, I'm open to the panel. I mean, who wants to be the seer and, and look into the future on that? Um, Stefan van, van S&P, is that, is that an area, I mean, I know you're looking quite upstream, but is that an area that you, you've looked at and, and have some view on? That is surprisingly an area, you know, which also upstream is of interest when it comes to raw materials because standardization would be something extremely desirable from a point of view, raw materials and the right recyclability of a battery. If you know there was a standardization which would allow mechanical uh, disintegration of the batteries, that would the carbon footprint of the recycling process quite a bit. And that's why, from a point of view upstream, that would be extremely desirable. Great. Benoit, do you have any any view on that, and in terms of your view in terms of the cell design? Um, it's it's you know uh, in my previous career I was uh, working at Airbus, so I've been involved in the design of aircraft, and uh, it was kind of a religion to say whether you should have one, two, three, or four engines. And I would say that for the battery cell format, it's it's almost the same. At the end of the day, when you perform the complete calculation in terms of energy density, in terms of cost. They all have pros and cons. The important thing, I guess, is to really make sure that the manufacturer um, is selecting a format in which they're going to be efficient uh, and they have the right competencies. So um, I think uh, um, all formats have pros and cons. Um, for what uh, is our concern, we are starting a large pouch. Uh, we have also some thoughts about cylindrical for other reasons. Um, we believe that cylindrical is offering a a great way to also like uh, contain some uh, some potential uh, um, thermal runaway risks, um, but we also have solution on the large push. I would add on that the fact that uh, it's very interesting when you speak with all the players in the sphere, and I can only uh, invite you to do so because uh, because um, a lot of them have made a lot of calculation tests and so on and so forth. The automotive industry has been looking at Tesla, who joined uh, the cylindrical business to start with, and uh, you probably know that uh, the rationale behind that. And since then, none of uh, uh, the others have, 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 have jumped into cylindrical. And the reason to have a cylindrical in Tesla is not that they are uh, what they are, it's just because this is what was available at some point. And then um, they have been reevaluating those uh, alternatives and, and, and still stick to that solution. So for me, format is one thing. Chemistry is another thing. I mean, we see a lot of interest again to LFP. Uh, connected to the previous point, uh, LFP in Europe is, is not yet there, and I think we are far from seeing it. It has uh, some also important drawbacks when it comes to the overall efficiency of a car, and it's much less interesting to recycle. So on and on, it's 
this is a real question. And then what next? What next? You know, it's NCX, it's uh, NMX, it's uh, LMNO. I mean, those technologies are also around here. Um, but when it comes to large volumes, I, our impression, and we'll see if there are announcements in the next few uh, years, but for what where we are today, it's it's uh, high nickel rich uh, uh, chemistries because it's clearly bringing a good balance between uh, environmental impact, cost, and density that is required to sales in it of the customer. I, I think we are at the very beginning of that industry. So uh, probably in five years time from now, we will see a split in the market, uh, which with much more variations that we don't have yet. But that's how we see things. You know, uh, we are just beginning and, and things will pro progressively settle as they have settled uh, over one century in the uh, IC, uh, IC uh, sector. Maybe if I, if I may, Christopher, so I, I fully agree with the points of Benoit. And uh, certainly, if you would have asked that question a few years ago, Christopher, I think there was kind of this vision that the pouch cell is, is going to be the big winner of the race, right? Now, with new designs, uh, certainly the prismatic cell has its, its advantages, the question of availability driving sometimes the cylindrical. So I think we are seeing a bit of a journey already on the, on, on the results when you're looking into your crystal ball as of today. Um, and, and I fully agree with the points Benoit said also in terms of the energy density and, and that influence factors and cost obviously is always a driver. I think that when it comes to the design of the cell also um, we need to bear in mind that partly the, this topic on the structural integrity I was touching before, right? So it's not that there is on the one hand the, the energy that we are taking out of the battery, that's right, but with certain designs also the, the um, design of your battery and how it behaves as a structure in the in the car when it would come to to a crash crash resistance what how are forces then in the end also happening in the vehicle is another parameter from the automotive industry i believe to make their choices when it comes to the design of the battery cell fantastic great so what we're going to do now um we're not done with our panel yet but we, we want to give them a short break because we're going to we're going to cut to an interview segment with tony Pershing at, at scania um what i mentioned we're going to talk a little bit about some of the uh from the oem point of view before we do that and and our panel is welcome to uh to to mute and camera off just for for 10 minutes or so whilst we turn to tony get a glass of water but again we're not done with you yet because there's lots more questions um just a quick uh also a reminder to uh, another prompt for for our audience uh, for those of you interested in, in automobile production, I'd really, and, and German speakers amongst you, I'd really uh, recommend our sister company's upcoming event in 1st of June, the Automobile Production Congress. Here you can see the speaker lineup kind of speaks for itself here in terms of the board members who, who are speaking at this event in Hanover. Um, so, so again, I really uh, recommend this as sister publication to AMS. We work a lot with our colleagues there to co-produce content, including the recent interview with Javier Ferreira, and he'll be speaking at this event. And we have another promotion for you, 20% uh, if you book um, via the code, which is being sent to you now. Uh, and the link with the promo code, promo20. So please keep that in, in mind as well. And, uh, um, you know, when you're, if you're a German speaker, so come see bitte vorbei and uh, we'll see you in, in Hanover. So now I just want to, we want to turn to Tony Pershing, who is again, Tony is leading battery production for Scania and they're in the process of ramping up uh, a, a module assembly plant in Sudatelia. And uh, it's quite an interesting project and we got some great views from him which we want to share with you. I want to just kind of kick off by talking a bit about Scania's current roadmap for battery production and electrification. Uh, I believe you already have some low volume battery production ongoing and, and you're ramping up the start of production at a new battery assembly facility in Sodatelia, which I think we see an image of right behind you, in fact. Um, um, you know, what are the key steps you're currently working on and what are some of the, the, the key milestones on the way to ramp up? Yeah, as you say, we do have um, a, a small scale uh, current uh, um, battery production, um, but uh, then uh, the project of setting up this, uh, well, as you see in the background here, it's a fast moving project. It's There are many stakeholders, uh, lots of areas affected, uh, but for us within assembly, uh, we're working on, on the producibility of the battery uh and, and to get material handling the production lines and it um ready to go and at the same time we are uh, constructing this building um that we see in the background then uh in itself so many things going on at the same time 
And, and tell us a little bit about what some of the main output and, and products that the battery plant and, and operations will be responsible for. Yeah, there will be batteries, uh, uh, of course, uh, but also power cables for commercial vehicles. And we will deliver uh, both the battery packs and uh, power cables for our final assembly of trucks and buses, which is located next to uh, the up and coming then, uh, battery factory. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what the, the assembly flow will look like uh, if we're talking about the, the layout, line length, numbers of workstations, etc. I mean, it can you give us a kind of sense of, 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 of what this, this flow and layout looks like? Mm -hmm. uh, this may, may maybe sound strange, but, but the process is actually not that complicated. Um, uh, it, it will be highly automated. Uh, it will be a high volume uh, factory. Um, the, the, the facilities will be roughly 18,000 square meters in total including logistic areas and including uh, module assembly, pack assembly, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, if we try to relate it um, to processes that we already have at, at Scania, powertrain or, or transmission production or assembly, those plants are, are bigger. Uh, they have more working stations. Uh, since we are so or will be so highly automated, certainly uh, those other processes definitely have um, uh, a higher workforce uh, there. We will be able to run this uh, around the clock, um, so with shift operations, not in a place where we can supply um, the, the, the chassis lines with the number of batteries needed. Uh, again, four, five, six batteries per uh, electrical vehicle. Where are some of the real focus areas uh, or, or opportunity areas for automation when we when we look at the battery assembly? Uh, first off, uh, I think there are well there are several drivers for automation. But uh, if if we look at the module uh, assembly, uh, there will be a cycle time of less than twenty seconds. So of course the repetitions there in themselves. Uh, together with uh, quite small amount of variation and uh, makes that perfect for uh, automation. And then also we are dealing with electrical components uh, with, with both high, quite high voltage class. So uh, there is that environmental or work environmental side to it as well. Um, and uh, since uh, we have this high repetition again, uh, this is a good base for, for uh, reaching a good level of quality with the high automation. So that's that's basically what we're looking at. You're using quite a bit of sort of a, um, autonomous mobile robots, AGVs in the process in terms of the logistics and the, the material flow. Is that is that also an area that I imagine can be quite automated in this case? Yeah, we will. Um, aim for well the, the module assembly again will be 100% automated uh, the pack assembly we will have some stations that are uh, consist of manual assembly but all the internal material handling uh, will be automated so we will use uh, AGV or AMR uh, our solutions uh, the Hyrex store will be automated so it's it's it will be a very high level of automation um, which gives us the possibility to venture in digitalization um, and, and data collection of the process. Obviously, you mentioned the, the cabling that's going to be produced there, but the battery pack and module itself is obviously in a, a high-tech product, lots of electronical components, uh, as well as software, different software integration, mm -hmm. heat thermal management. Uh, how significant is that in the, in the module production? Uh, what role does it play and perhaps also in, in the overall strategic approach to, to assembly? Mm. Yeah, I'd like to break that down into, into a few parts. Um, if, if we talk about the thermal, uh, first of all, that's a very important part of, of, uh, of the battery and the battery design. And, and then that becomes a delicate part of the, of the production uh, of the battery pack. So that is for sure one one issue that we are looking into and, and speaking then of, of, of thermal and thermal properties of, of the battery. 
uh, one thing uh, related to that topic that we do is <clears throat> we, we do gather information from, from the cell supplier from Northvolt about the um, um, uh, data uh, from, from the cell production. Uh, which we scan and, and compare to measured data that we do uh, when we receive the cells and see that everything is in order, so to say. And then we measure that uh, at several points throughout uh, the process to see that um, there is no risk for thermal runaway or anything along those lines. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there are many important parts of, of, of that. Does it require uh, the other kind of use of specific materials as well to to help to kind of manage that is that uh, playing a role in, in the production too it it, it does i mean <clears throat> we, we are uh, leaning towards the design part of the battery uh, there and um, but but for production uh, we we will uh, use new adhesives uh, within the production uh, which are quite delicate to apply to the product. Uh, we need to be very careful about the amount that we apply to get the correct thermal properties uh, on the product, on the battery and so on and so forth. So uh, applying um, adhesives is, is nothing new for us. It's, it's an old knowledge, so to say, but the context is new. Uh, so th there are some innovation involved uh, in in this area. When we think about software-defined cars, and, and in this case, many ways, software-defined batteries, um, it, you know, it, it does it does perhaps imply on the data side updates, etc., which uh, which which could, could perhaps play a role in in how at least the understanding of the battery from production side. I wonder if that's something that that is on you know kind of in, in important for Scania. Mm, yeah, battery management is certainly high up on the agenda, uh, certainly on the R&D side, uh, but that has a big impact uh, in, in terms of inline testing and end of line testing within the production facility, uh, how we communicate uh, on the complete vehicle with the battery, but, but how we can replicate that in the battery assembly. Uh, that communication between vehicle and battery and battery management system and so on. And battery management system is something that we at Scania regard as, uh, as a core competence. So certainly um, an, an important field within battery production. Uh, for those of you who want to see more of that interview, uh, we have a full version available on the AMS website. Uh, there's a there's a there's a link which is being dropped into your into your chat right now. So check check out the rest of that. But I didn't want to lose. I know we're running a bit over time, but but I have we have this great panel here. I wanted to spend a bit more time with them. Benoit sent his regards. He did have to leave a bit early, so we'll follow up with Benoit and a few other questions and points. Um, but I wanted to start just kind of on the back of some of the things that Tony was talking about uh, with you, Stefan, um, in in terms of the the thermal management side, which obviously he 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 identified as really important and 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 delicate in the in the manufacturing of the of the modules. And actually, we had some questions specifically on this point come from the audience. So can you talk a little bit about how you're working with your customers specifically on this point, uh, whether in the cell or and or the module production? Yes, Chris, I'm happy to do so, and uh, very happy that Tony brought this this point up as as one of the the essential things when it comes to make then in the end also in the vehicle the the battery work right. So I mean we know um, thermal management for sure uh, in the typical electric applications you're looking to ECUs TCUs for for decades we're using thermal materials in order to take the heat out of the heat source to the to the cooling plate or to the to the cooling part can also be the, the housing and um, I think one of the the main challenges um, when looking to the battery is not to make a product that can cope with the conductivity um, but to address the volumes we need to bear in mind that typically in such a classical electronic in, uh, in, uh, component you're talking about five ten let's be generous 15 cc of material that you need to dispense in the certain tech time in order to keep your line up and running right when we are now thinking of a battery and even in the case of scania from the size even bigger potentially we are talking about liters of material that need to be dispensed into that battery pack 
still keeping this this tag time. So we are talking about volumes of 50, 60 uh, cc per second that need to be dispensed. And here is where um, we and Henkel believe again in the in the um, uh, partnership with the different areas that are playing in. So we are talking with our customers, so mainly the OEMs, also the battery manufacturers when it comes to thermal now in the implementation in the vehicle, for sure the OEM is the leading partner here. Having then also the equipment manufacturer as, as another player into the game in order to ensure that we have a seamless integration of the process. And then we can, as a material supplier, start tweaking with the size of our fillers with other tweaks in, in, in order to the characteristics of the material to ensure the flow. Yeah? And the equipment manufacturer, on the other hand, is then in the responsibility to make the process also happen so that we can then keep the super high tech times. And this will, in the end, also be the leading um, factor when it comes to uh, the cost efficiency of, of that solution, right? So I think that this is a very, very big portion of the challenge around the, the thermal materials, if I may say. Great. And, and, and Claude, you know, as, as, as Tony was referring to the, the, the complexity around battery management systems, software, uh, you know, managing that also in in the production environment. Um, is that is that something um, you know an area cloud in 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 you know your your members is kind of looking at too as as we get into this ramp up. Really, this again we always come back to the ecosystem. I think of of different players involved here and who's managing that. But but that that seems to be really critical as well as we as we go to this ramp up and introduce new new players and skills into the ecosystem. Yes, indeed, uh, there are several aspects here. Some are the classical one. I mean, the technical aspect that was mentioned by Stefan about, yes, uh, new actors, new players in, in the value chain that uh, need to, to bring their know-how and, and expertise to make more competitive battery, new design appearing and, and so on. Uh, I would like to underline one other aspect which is related to re really regulation, which is something that we are more, in fact, interfacing and representing our members. It's not unknown by the regulators that batteries become intelligent. And in the new batteries regulation, you have this idea that almost everything could be captured by the battery, manu battery management system, which is a kind of, you know, non-knowledgeable uh, people just imagining how far or you could go with a request about the uh, battery management system. But the result is today we will have in the regulation new uh, mandatory uh, expectation from this uh, battery management system, which particularly is supposed to provide uh, in real time the so-called state of health of the battery, uh, which if you think about it, it's not so easy to realize because the battery in a car is just you know functioning at some intermediate state of charge and so on. And it, it should be, in fact, instantly provide to the user and all information about what is the total capacity, which has not been measured, for example, since the last full charge, which could be several months ago, uh, should be provided about a number of uh, parameters that finally we, we feel are not so easy to measure just because there is not such a good understanding by the authorities and the, the global uh, vision of how far and what are really the useful progress to the battery industry and what are really uh, additive requirements that just may add uh, some some potential constraints uh, without really uh, added value we see a little bit the same thing when it's comes about traceability you know because attached to this uh, uh, vision of what should be the, the next digital uh, step for uh, traceability then we have new uh, actors in the value chain coming uh, you know, to establish this system of unique identification, uh, which are deployed along all the value chain. Where do your uh, cobalt from come from? Where do your uh, any material come from? And all of this has to be consolidated in a unique format with a, a guaranteed traceability, you know, based on these uh, new uh, systems, uh, uh, which are currently being developed and that's quite new in fact i have to say to the battery industry to be, have such a an important deployment of all of these possibility requirement which ultimately certainly are useful for the end users to have complete traceability and transparency of where the battery come from or it is manufactured so we recognize some benefit of it 
On the other hand, once again, I have to say, sometimes the ambitious is really very ambitious and the solution that will be just able to, to fulfill the new uh, legal requirements could finally be quite complex and potentially quite costly as well, uh, which ultimately may be, well, until we have this kind of customization or let's say, uh, standardization rather of solutions uh, require from the industry significant effort to have uh, these built in their, their batteries when when the regulation will uh, require this quite soon i would say in three four years from now okay so again um it's just demonstrating the complexity of this we're, we're, we're coming close to the end but we want to spend a little bit of time just to as well we're going over time i know but um, um uh, just talking about the future um uh, you know, firstly, and again, audience questions came in on this point as well. If we look at the next generation, um, you know, battery and pack design, um, you know, how, how scalable do we see cell to pack or even cell to chassis designs um, uh, in, in terms of, you know, versus the module pack um, and, and maybe the impacts that may have on the supply chain, perhaps even upstream when we look further. Um, maybe I'll start with you on that, Stefan. Uh, with oh, sorry, I, I need to always probably not, I probably meant not with me. There's nothing I can comment on. I meant, <laughs> I meant, I meant uh, Stefan Henkel. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No. All right. Uh, take that question. Uh, happy to do so. So, I mean, first of all, um, there, there are there is a huge dynamic in this industry. We, we said that during uh, the session today several times, and I think one of the big things that we are seeing in the industry right now is this rethinking of the design. So be it um, to, to talk about a real a cell to pack design or even a real full integration into the chassis, right? So, I mean, there is also the discussion ongoing on, on cell to body um, uh, as, as kind of the, the next step. And um, what, what I believe in is it's overall not an, uh, is it the one or the other solution? So I, I truly believe that the, the module design will still accompany us for quite a while as it's a very good design on the one hand, and also in terms of, we were talking about the automation, how does this work in the process, in the plant, how are uh, the, the batteries integrated then into, into the battery uh, in, in the vehicle, when you're thinking on the modules, the handling of all of that, the pick and place, the, the dispensing of thermal material, the adhesives that you're working, is all by far easier to handle compared to a cell stack that can then in the end contain I don't know, something between 40 or 50 cells on, on a uh, length of two meters or so that you need still to keep all into a shape design um, and make sure that there are not too many variances. So this means that I believe that the module as such will not disappear, right? So it will be kind of two streams, if you will, in, in, the, in the designs. When it comes to, to sell to pack, there are many challenges out there. I mean, uh, it's the structural integrity is how to handle this in the process. That's a very big step. I was saying it before. Also here partnering with equipment manufacturers to ensure that we can also precisely run all these processes. And on the other hand, a big challenge also for, for us as material suppliers, you're thinking that before we were kind of responsible to make sure that the thermal um, aspects are covered. Now it's a thermal conductive adhesive that's required. So basically two functions into one material. Um, and, and we are heavily and closely working with our customers on, on making that happen. However, I don't expect that cell to pack will be kind of as of tomorrow, the new standard, if you will. Right? I think there are still a couple of hurdles to really make that happen uh, in the way the imagination is there right now at many customers. Um, but I, I truly believe that the concept will, will come and that we will be part supporting to make this happen. If, yes, Claire. Uh, Yes, if I may add a point here, it's uh, again related to regulation, but sometimes, you know, regulation can have more influence than you would expect. You have to understand that in this regulation, there is an article 11, which talk about removability replaceability. And you may say, well, this is for portable batteries, but in fact, it's not. Today, the, the parliament has insisted that this is applicable to electric vehicle batteries as well. And we are very reluctant as the industry representation to, uh, let's say, let it go in this direction because as Stefan just mentioned, there is a lot of potential innovation there, a lot of uh, multiple solutions for competitiveness. And we worry that just, you know, high level view from, from the regulator saying, uh, well, 
general requirements about removability would help uh, sustainability in general, which is a thinking which comes from the portable batteries, you know, and uh, small appliances. But it's been extended to uh, EV just because people just don't really know the reality and, and the consequences. But we cannot guarantee, unfortunately, that there will be nothing. Uh, we will, of course, discuss. We try to, of course, limit the influence of the regulator on the freedom of design and, and, and competitiveness. But, well, we have to say today in the text is something that says batteries should be easily removable, which in fact would be a big hurdle for a design cell to chassis or things like that. I hope that something which will be mitigated between now and the, 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 the final text is released. But uh, here there are some, in fact, kind of risk that has to be taken on board and uh, try to be mitigated before they go too far. Absolutely. Very, very valid point, Claude. And also, this is a discussion we are having with the OEMs also when it comes to the repairability, et cetera, right? I mean, imagine all the number of vehicles that will then be on the road. And if then you have an issue with a certain cell and the battery management system, we're talking about software is telling you that there are one or a few cells that are maybe in the critical uh, stage of their life. Um, then, then you want to be also able to replace them and not to replace the full pack, right? So that's also discussion, let's say, in this so-called aftermarket area that we are also uh, looking into with our customers um, to, to understand how that should then really work in the moment that you can't take just the, the box, if you will, um, of, the, of the module out of the battery pack, right? But you have all that, that cells that are stacked to each other, that are um, glued to each other. Uh, so how to manage that and how to replace Yeah, That's a very, very valid point, Claude. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, that touch with uh, safety. I mean. We are also very much attached in, in recharge to make sure that the regulation do not jeopardize uh, potentially safety. This trend to say, uh, again, coming from the portable industry batteries, to say a uh, consumer should be empowered to do own repair is absolutely nonsense for electric vehicle batteries, <laughs> these high voltage products. I hope that nobody will have the bad idea to, to authorize uh, self repair. But also, this is a type of hazard and, and communication we did really need to forward to avoid such kind of misled regulation. So clearly, clearly something we could we could go on a, a lot about, and, and I'm, I'm tempted to, but I know we'll have to come close to the end. Maybe a quick other quick insight on a future technology. Uh, Stefan Schlach, do you see from the upstream side, you know, would 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 solid state battery? Be a you know be an important development, uh, or is it something that you've looked at from upstream side as well as realistic in the time frame? Obviously, we've seen things happen and not happen in the industry. Just thought that might be a final point from from your side. No, I think solid state is is a technology that is coming that is not too far from from going into not mass production, but being used in high end cars. And from there, I think there is some uncertainty and I, and I think the uncertainty goes somehow with how reliable and safe do normal lithium ion batteries, so non-solid state batteries, turn out to be? You know, how, how big is the remaining risk of a battery catching fire? I think, you know, as as there are more and more cars on the on the road, that will be seen. And if there is a considerable risk that's that's remaining with the traditional battery, then I see more potential for uh, the solid state battery also uh, to be used in in you know lo lower lower end cars, you know not the, not the very low end but, but low end cars. Uh, so I think that the future of solid state batteries is is open and to some extent dependent on how traditional batteries are turning out to, to, to be with you to, to safety aspects. Maybe adding to that one, if I may, Stefan, um, also for sure, we had that discussion uh, also also before with, with Benoit still, uh, it will certainly be also a cost question, right? So, I mean, if, if uh, the, the classical lithium batteries with the order of magnitude of factories that we are seeing ramping production with the tech times also having the potential to manage their, their cost side, then it's also the question where the solid state battery will kick in from a cost perspective, right? Fantastic. Well, I just want to leave with a final question. Um, just looking ahead, 
um, a little bit where you see the development of, of battery manufacturing in, in let's say, a, a, over the next sort of five to seven years. So the kind of medium term, just 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 your view from your company and also from the industry. industry. Uh, Claude, I want to I want to start with you there. Obviously, that'll be a critical period, I think, on the regulatory side as well. Yes, indeed. So we have big challenges in front of us. Um, I would say, yes, we all hope that we will be successful with all the gigafactories starting in, in Europe. We all understand as well that uh, all the ecosystem attached to the battery manufacturing will be coming with or a bit later with this whole system. So that's really the plan. Uh, unfortunately, the risks are also there. And as you correctly mentioned, probably they are rather short term uh, because the need of electrification probably will survive hopefully for years and industry will have time to adapt or maybe to later develop. But on the short term, we have this big challenge to be successful very quickly, uh, have qualified product from Europe and so on. And so our approach here is to say, uh, just to conclude as, as Richard, which represents, let's say, an industry expectation, just we are very careful or try to emphasize that this balance uh, between European uh, competitiveness, which is really key to succeed against the existing and continuing Asian uh, competition, will not disappear because we have this uh, European move. Uh, so this balance of European competitiveness with European sustainability and, and let's say using the su sustainability as a competitive tool is really something we want to, uh, to achieve. We, we will really insist with the regulators that uh, in fact regulation goes his way and helps the industry uh, moving his way. And as I said, uh, on some instances, it's not always the case. So we still have a lot of messages to do and uh, play our part uh, to make all of these industries be, be successful. Thank you very much. So Stefan from S&P, again, next five years, do we expect on the upstream side uh, perhaps some of the anxieties hopefully to, to start to even out <laughs> we may well, we have yeah. found other things to worry about by then yeah. i don't know <laughs> no anxiety and, and nervousness i mean that's what characterizes the situation with new to raw materials at the moment pretty good and i think um, uh, it is an exaggeration what we see in terms of prices and in terms of nervousness um from our you know, from from the analysis that we've done with you to the sufficiency of raw materials, we uh, uh, think that by and large raw materials will be sufficient. You know, even taking into account very optimistic expectations when it comes to the growth of um, electric vehicles, um, we think that you know, from a point of view of investor interest, uh, that there is much exaggeration of that sharpness around and being discussed discussed about um, that sure is too much at stake as you know automotive industry could not be nervous but i think um, we'll see over the next one to two years you know some kind of of relief and some kind of you know more normal situation as also you know the, the larger volumes become become routine and 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 as it as we think it will become clear that supplies are by and large uh, sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, Stefan Hofer, um, last thoughts looking out over the next five years, where you where you hope things to be in in the in the ramp up for battery production, and and of course Henkel's Henkel's role within that. Thanks. No, I think that um, I, I can also conclude in the direction like Claude and Stefan already did, right? I mean, um, we will we'll see this happen. Uh, that's that's the first clear thing. Um, there are many challenges still to be solved, uh, and uh, um, this is going to happen, I believe, truly in, in certain setups of partnership, of strong collaboration uh, within the industry. I think that will be key enablers, if you will. From an angle perspective, to say what, where, where are we seeing ourselves in, in a couple of years in the battery industry, um, I mean, I could easily say we, we want uh, to be number one whenever it comes to any functional coding to adhesives, thermal solutions, gaskettings in that part of the industry, right? But I think that um, maybe to state that a bit more differentiated, Henkel is doing significant investments in, in this area. We are hiring battery experts 
experts. We want really to understand to the detail um, about that technology. We are building in Düsseldorf a battery lab, um, even down handling uh, active batteries for testing our materials in the live use case. So increasing dramatically our capabilities to understand all the functioning around and then be able with this to support the industry and make this happen and, and be here a uh, thought leader. Uh, to all the topics that I've mentioned earlier today, right? So on the one hand, technology-wise, when it comes to make happen the, the energy density, the extension of the driving range, these new designs, but also addressing truly passenger safety. And we'll also later on, I, I guess, uh, connect further with, with Claude on the question of, of battery recycling. Also here, we would like to be front runner, be thought leader, be a sparring partner also, um, as we are investing a lot in building the right level of know-how to then support this industry to have the electric vehicles on the road out there. Fantastic. Well, I think you've, you've all given us a lot to think about, um, some, some, some key challenges to address, but, but a lot of opportunities ahead, not least, I think, it's in the, in the kind of saying of the day, the, the, the ecosystem, the partnerships that are forming, um, <clears throat> and, and some reasons to, uh, to, to, to not worry quite as much, perhaps, as, as the commodity markets do uh, at, at the moment. So I think um, it's been a very insightful 80 minutes or so. Thanks for our audience for sticking with us this time. Thank you so much for, for our, our panelists for, for joining us for this long and sharing this much. We really appreciate it. Um, just want to wanna thank thank again um, our, our sponsor for this for this event, Henkel. Um, again, for the, for the great insight and also the support across the board here. And as we've heard, lots of great services to the battery to the battery industry. So thanks again to Henkel. Um, a few more things just to keep our audience up to date. Please think, consider joining us next week. We have another great webinar on reducing capital investment by 20% in different areas of automation. So this is another another webinar. I really encourage you to you to join April 6th. Uh, again, there's a link coming right at you. Uh, so consider joining that next week uh, on April 6th. And um, I hope you'll join us next month as well. Uh, our, our AMS Automotive Evolution live streams uh, will be monthly, um, except when we have events. And next week, next next month, April 27th, we're talking about modular production um, and, and flexible automation around that. So again, we have another link coming at you. We've given you so much to register for. We we basically booked your your calendar for the next two months, and that that was the idea. So consider joining us for that as well. With a lot more to share. Um, and, and that goes across our, our Evolution live stream series. So follow us on our website. This episode will be available completely on demand, um, latest by tomorrow morning. Uh, so you can rewatch anything you missed and share. I uh, encourage you to do that and share with your colleagues. Uh, if you're interested in getting in touch and participate, um, there's my details. Also my colleague, Amos Sarek, who's a senior content producer, helping us put on these programs as well. So we hope, we hope to hear from you and continue these discussions much further, including at our uh, event in May and our upcoming live streams and a lot more to come throughout the year. Uh, thanks again to the panel and thanks for everyone. This has really been a fantastic discussion and uh, looking forward to, to talking more about it very soon. Thanks Thank for having us, Christopher. Thank you.